Hello, I am Mo Levin, the founder of the North American Bitcoin Conference, and I am sitting here with Ian Rogers from Ledger. Hey Mo, how are you? Thanks for, thanks for having me on. Easy intro. Um, let's talk Ledger. Turn Ledger. off Slack real quick, because it's, otherwise it'll just keep tapping at us. <laughs> Okay, send an invite link. Let's start. Uh, let's have a bunch more people on it. Done. Okay. Um, Ledger. Six, seven years ago, Ledger was exhibiting at my events on a pop-up table with uh, two guys, and the most innovative and interesting thing was a soup can, which said, uh, "Like a Campbell's, like Warhol's Campbell soup tin," but there was a Ledger inside it. Um, and has since grown to a company of 200 plus people, loved everywhere, innovative, really cool company. A, a One of the companies, and there are not that many of them in crypto, to be so large, so well loved, and um, one of the successes early on in crypto. I remember in 2014, People were looking around, there wasn't very many companies. And somebody said to me, you know, if you look around this room, there's going to be one or two of these that are going to be the Microsoft, the Apples of the industry. And we don't know which ones, but there's a couple of them that are going to be there. A couple of them are going to win and be the leaders in the industry. So Ian, you have seen multiple waves of tech. What are you seeing in crypto that is reminding you of when you started getting involved with it? What parallels are you drawing? How are you seeing this? Welcome to the industry. This is your first couple of years in, in blockchain. How has it been? Yeah, I will really let you talk. Probably my, my, my first interview as a, as a member of Ledger. So, so, so thank you very much. Um, well, you know, my, my background is, you know, I studied computer science in the early 90s and, and graduated in 1994, which was a super exciting time because you had, um, you know, it, it, was, it was all promise at that point. You know, you had, and, and I think that the thing that reminds me of now is, you had at the time, it's hard to imagine today, but but you had kind of a lot of people who were saying, all oh, the open web, kind of a standards based web is not the future, you know, um, and, and it's going to look more like closed environments like America Online and CompuServe than, you know, than the open web. And, and, you know, I think many of us really believed in the promise of the open web and, and what that would do to break down um, you know, the, the, the stranglehold or the, um, really the, the barriers to entry that's created in the, in the kind of the old, the old media world, which is where I was playing. I was working, working with music and, and some of the early digital video at the time. And, and, you know, the, the promise that we saw was this promise of, of unlimited distribution. You know, the fact that if I wanted to make a magazine, I no longer, you know, needed to print 50,000 copies at a huge cost or find someone to publish my article. I could, I could self-publish and send someone a URL and then every, everyone could see it. That was, you know, it, it, that, that, that seems so trivial today, but it was, was actually really, um, uh, you know, just kind of an amazing idea at the time. And I always said back then that, you know, the internet made sense immediately for anyone who had ever tried to make a magazine with a Sharpie and a photocopier because they knew the pain of distribution and the promise of, you know, of, of unlimited distribution. And then, you know, for me personally, I did 20 years of digital music from, uh, you know, being a part of the team that, that distributed Winamp and Shoutcast and ultimately Nutella, and, you know, up to, you know, be, being on the, on the team that launched Apple Music. Um, I, I kind of, you know, if you think about kind of the end of the distribution where, you know, from my perspective, it was sort of, you know, the fix was in. The music business had successfully gone through, you know, two, two levels of digitization and the entire business was kind of 99% digital at, at that point. And, and so that, that's, for me, the, the, where my, my pattern matching comes from. And what I see right now is we're at that stage where everything is promised. Um, you know, if you, if you, you know, Chris Dixon wrote a piece back in 2019, where he talks about there's strong tech and weak tech, and they always come in pairs. And I think if you look back at the beginning of the web, you had that kind of, you know, the strong tech was the, you know, the open web and Netscape and the weak tech was, that was kind of, you know, the, the training wheels or the stepping stone on the way to the strong tech was America online. You know, people wanted the value of an online community, but not the the kind of the the scariness of the of the open web, the the, the big, um, you know, kind of 
you know, it was more, more promise than user experience in a way. And I think today we have that where you have, you know, self-custody as the strong tech and the promise and the, the, the sort of full freedom of, of what cryptocurrency can, can bring to society. And then you've got, you know, the, the, the stepping stones along the way, like, like the exchanges, which help people kind of just like anti in on their, on, on their way to that. So I, I think that that's kind of, that's kind of where we are and what draws me to the space broadly. It's an interesting parallel. I mean, the, the market before rewarded the good, easy tech and punished the ones that, and those aren't around anymore. The closed loop systems and the ones that made it difficult um, and the ease of access um, and the distribution of things and the ease of distribution and the ease of access, those are the, the winners. Um, which is- Yeah, although I think you know, it is an interesting parallel and I've been thinking a lot about it. I'm not, I'm not totally sure it's, it's the right one, but I think it's interesting that you know, there's no question in hindsight that you know, AOL was the weak tech and Netscape was the strong tech. But let, let's, let's not forget that at one point, you know, AOL bought Netscape, right? And- uh, Everybody also, had the CDs. The question well, is and, that- it, you know, And also, also Mark Andreessen has done okay. He's right? done, um, I, think, I think he's done okay. Yeah, I need to yeah. check. But. So you see my point that this is not, it's not a zero sum game. No, it's not a zero sum game. And maybe that's a, a good answer to the next question, which was you have systems, the exchanges, Binance looks untouchable. It is a huge company. CZ did extremely well building Binance from nothing into what it is now. The volumes they handle, the, the customer support, everything they have is very easy, but none of the promise of crypto, of holding your own money, being your own bank is offered there. Maybe they develop a de decentralized exchange or something else, but that's the sort of tricky thing is, is it a zero sum game where Binance wins and self custody wins and they both go side and side or play with each other? Or is there going to be a singular winner and the market will need to adapt to it? I think it's a, I think it's a big sky. And I think what you, what you have is you have, um, you know, digital assets broadly, right? Um, I think that, look, look again, let's, let's zoom out a little bit. From my perspective, um, you know, the, the reason that I'm attracted to the space overall is because I think it's very easy to say that digital assets broadly, cryptocurrency more specifically, security and privacy are all things that will be more valuable tomorrow than they are today. Right. And I think within that, there's a big sky and a lot of um, yeah. a lot of opportunity. Right. So I would say, OK, you know, if the parallel is that's just sort of the Internet and the idea of, you know, interconnectivity. Right. And if, if you if you say, OK, what we're actually building, I mean, and, and again, I'm you're, you're I'm, I'm, I'm uh, kind of contextualizing it as an Internet guy. Right. That's where I come from. And so from my perspective, what we what was so exciting uh, about the Internet in the mid 90s was this idea of unlimited distribution. Right. And part of the reason that we built Nutella was we saw the music business suing Napster and we said, you guys really don't get it distribution is trivial now. And, 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 and we need to just let that genie all the way out of the bottle so we can move on from the notion that distribution is trivial. I think what you have um, with digital assets is for the first time you have, we've kind of turned the internet inside out and you have the notion that digital, that, that, that digital can bring us scarcity or it can, it can bring us um, you know, commitments and, and control and that has, a whole set of, of you know, of um, of applications. You know, I, I love it when Naval Ravikant says, you know, of course the internet will have its own money, right? Thinking anything else is like thinking the internet would use the U.S. mail or or La Post to to send a you know to, to send mail. Of course it wouldn't. Of course the, of course it, it will. Um, but but also the idea of building applications at at scale where the commitment layer you know is is in the protocol. If, if you will, right? Um, you, we have this opportunity, I think, to fix some of the major deficiencies of the internet, such as identity, right? I mean, you know, identity is such a major deficiency that it's, you know, you know, we can go on Netflix and watch a documentary called The Social Dilemma, and we can see kind of, you know, the extent 
to which society is being harmed by the fact that the internet didn't really solve the problem of identity. So that, that from my perspective, that the big sky is, is within all of that. And I, I, for me personally, I think about, look, yes, there is there is this kind of this, um, this excitement around, uh, you know, around, around digital currency. And, and, and you could say in the, in the, you know, the store of value sense of Bitcoin in, in the programmatic sense, such as Ethereum is the state state owned sense, like, you know, uh, C, CBDCs. Um, and, and there's, there's, that's a whole, the, the sky is big with that alone. But then I think when you start taking it further out and you think about, um, you know, the, the, the other things that, that will be possible with, with digital assets broadly, you know, whether it's NFTs, social tokens, you know, you, you, you see kind of the, the, the effects of, of this, of this, you know, really, I, I think it's, it's, you know, it's, if the internet was about unlimited distribution for the first 20 years, you know, it's, it's where can we go collectively with, with, um, with the notion of limited distribution. It's almost as if, like you're saying, the internet started off, well, first, it, it became open and broad and super broad and everybody can access it and it's open for everybody. And then slowly got more limited and limited. And what much of blockchain tech is reopening these worlds and and in er, fixing what was what was not fixed yet i think that's certainly the potential right and potential um, fix yeah and i and i think that that um you know there there's um you know it, it, uh, again i also think that we have these opportunities that are around security and privacy which are which are still kind of as yet as yet untapped you know we're, we're um we're just scratching the surface of, you know, a- adding usability to what's possible there. Well, what started off as just you need to have a database to ac- a-, a login to access something has then turned into Cambridge Analytica, which is, I mean, that's to the extreme. And now people are saying, well, there's another option here. Let's build something better using new technology that's now made available. And fixing what was never a priority and that's i guess you're right the potential of and the promise of crypto or this technology i, I think also there's you know I would, I would point to something bigger that we're all feeling and the kind of the the facebook the the crypto the the cambridge analytica you know points us this direction which is you know the internet has always been moving culture from you know from mass to niche um, it was Jeff Jarvis who wrote, you know, what would Google do said, you know, talked about this back in, in 2008. And, you know, his point actually was, this has been happening, you know, since the eighties, you know, he was saying that the VCR and, and cable television started moving us this direction. The internet moves us further this direction from mass to niche. You could argue that the Cambridge Analytica piece is just kind of a logical part of that, right? Because, you know, we, we, we gravitate as human beings toward people and, and, and communities that, that have, you know, tastes that are similar to us. I think what you have right now is, you know, the internet has become, you know, a very important kind of communication layer that sits underneath all that we do. You know, we've gone from, you know, when I started on the internet, there were about, you know, uh, about 80 million computers on planet earth, you know, to today we have, you know, 4.5 billion people connected to the internet with smartphones, you know, so they're literally carrying the internet around with them um, at, at, at all times. So I think it's also kind of natural that, that um, you know, the, the utility would start to move in, into, you know, smaller places. You know, that's, this is why, you know, and it's to me, it's related to what we do because you look at, at, at you know, things like, um, you know, social tokens and the small communities um, small, highly valuable communities that 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 those are are creating, and that that doesn't feel new to me. It feels like a very natural progression from kind of you know three channels on television that we all gather around and watch at seven p.m. You know to a small community of like-minded individuals, um, you know who create value, you know a- a- amongst themselves. Um, and, you know, to me, that also feels like the early days of the internet, you know, the, the, the feels, feels much more like Usenet when Usenet was mostly people from academia, um, you know, than, uh, Twitter, right. Which is, which is, you know, kind of the, the, the community yeah. square. Usenet was great to pirate everything. 
Uh, well, you know, it's Whole an interesting energy. thing. We're talking about the ebb and flow of broad and niche in the internet. Um, we don't talk at all about curation and, and the natural progression of VCR to Cambridge Analytica is makes sense, but there, what's the take, what's your take on a curated experience online and curating a personal experience? Because what we have seen over the last 10 years is the companies decide what you'll be interested in and we'll keep feeding you based on limited information what you will like, and here's your Discover Weekly on Spotify, and here's your news articles that are related, and here's the YouTube, and here's your people that bought this will also like this. How well, does that so change? You're, we're, we're, we're walking you know, a, a distance away from my role at Ledger, but we're talking about something that's very close to my heart, so I'm super happy to answer. You know, we, we had a, when we started Beats Music, um, a lot of people said, what are you doing? What's the point? Um, you know, there, there's iTunes, there's Spotify, there's, there's Mog, there's uh, Deezer. Like, does the world need, you know, beats to enter the space? And we said, look, what we care about here is, you know, we, we, we believe that, you know, Spotify is a great technical solution, but we don't think it's a great musical solution. We think, you know, Spotify tells people, um, hey, we've got 50 million songs. And our point of view is people don't want 50 million songs, right? I mean, actually, that's provable. There are 50 million songs, but people only really care about about 900,000 of them. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but secondly, people want like one song right now. They can't listen, you know, and they don't know which one it is. So our entire premise for Beats Music was curation. That's why we hired the, you know, the head of uh, you know, our, our editor came from Pitchfork. We hired really the best editors in the world. Um, Carl Cherry, who is today the hip hop editor at Spotify, was was the was the hip hop editor at Beats Music. About, you know, before mm -hmm. before we launched, and and all the way through our Apple um, period. So we believe, you know, really wholeheartedly in curation. I actually think it goes further than that. I mean, I have a friend um, who feeds his family by day trading based on the information that he gets from Twitter. Right. So the, the reason I find that and his what he would tell you is it's all about curation. What he would say is the information is all out there. You know, the power, is, it goes to the people who can successfully curate that information. If you can separate and this is certainly true in the crypto world. Right. If you can separate the good information from the FUD, you can do extraordinarily well, as, as I'm sure your your audience knows. At the same time, you know, you can find your, you could also use all of that information is available to, uh, you know, volunteer for ISIS, right? You know, so that, that it's all out there. And, and I think that kind of our success as human beings will be, you know, how, how well can we kind of resist the, the, you know, the temptation to waste time and how well can we, can we curate? And I think that over time we will grab, you know, we'll gravitate towards tools which, which help us do that. And I find it, you know, amazing that tools like Twitter and Instagram have spent all this time telling us to follow more instead of follow better, right? I mean, imagine if they, if they you know, if, if the metric of success on their side wasn't how many people you follow, but how much value you derive from their platform. I think that they would, you know, they would have built completely different products. And I think that that's, that's what the, that's what, that's what the future is. And either we manage that as individuals and the more successful individuals are better at that. And the, and the less successful individuals are the one that just scroll endlessly. How does that look? They get, they get it's always your responsibility to curate things yourself. Do you trust? Uh, it maybe trust is the wrong word, but are we capable of curating ourselves? I, you know, I think that, but I think that that's it. I think that over time, you know, look, and you're, you're going to have all kinds of people, right? You know, what's happened in my view is we've just lived through that period when we didn't know that cigarettes cause cancer. Now we know, and, um, and, you know, not everyone quit smoking, but, you know, a, a lot of people did and they, and they invested in other parts of their personal health, right? You know, you can, you can just be not sick or you can be healthy mm -hmm. and, you know, not everyone makes the same choice on that scale. And, you know, and I, I think that, um, you know, it'll be the same when it comes to these things, but I think that we will also, you know, find tools which help us do that. You know, my, my old, my oldest daughter is, is working on a project called ration. If you go to ration.fyi, you can kind of see what she's up to, but that's exactly what she's trying to do is to build a tool 
um, that helps you curate your media experience better um, using trusted curators um, to, you know, it's kind of a new way to share and a new way to consume that, that helps. And I think that, you know, the question is, will everyone choose her product over Twitter? Of course not. You know, um, will some people and enough for it to be a compelling business? Yeah, I, I believe so. Um, and I think that that's the future that we live in. Again, it's not a zero sum game. No, um, I think you can see it already because I think people spend time. Um, they spend time in discords. They spend time in subreddits. They spend time in Slack. They spend time in crypto Twitter, which is a subset of Twitter, right? You know what I mean? Like your, your people already kind of, um, you know, they 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 do they do curate. There, I, I think that sure people s form their own groups and form their own niche and networks. Um, but it's, it's different than what your daughter is building, which is is almost like a concierge on demand, personal shopping, personal curation, understanding your goals. And and what that has been historically with, with art is you would call up Phillips, Christie's or Sotheby's and they would have somebody which tells you, you know, this artist is up and coming. And I think you might be interested because you're interested in, you know, this trend theme concepts and Bringing it back to crypto, um, I don't know if there's a analog there with curation or I know that it'll be more difficult when people own their own data, which will come very soon um, for curation to happen. And I think I think the way that I would bring it back to crypto is, you know, if you think about security and privacy, you know, I just spent five years in the luxury business working with LVMH, you know, in a in an industry which is all about that kind of personal concierge experience where. You know, it's it's the opposite of buying a commodity. It's the opposite of buying batteries on Amazon. You know, you you walk in and um, they offer you a glass of champagne. They know when your when your wedding anniversary is, um, and you know the you're a part of a culture, yeah. um, and and you're also you know you could say that the very biggest luxury brands you know such as as Chanel and Louis Vuitton and Hermes are very 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 niche. Right. So if you put the number of customers at one of those brands over the number of people on planet Earth, you know, the number, the, the, the fraction is pretty small. Um, yet they are fantastic businesses um, and they're in the business of self-expression in a way. They're in the business of building communities, you know, as it would be another way to put it. You know, you you're a, you're a customer because you identify with, um, yeah. you know, with with the community. Uh, and I and I think that 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 is something that you know is 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 very relevant. Again, I don't I don't think it will be a a, a zero sum game in, in in the world of crypto. I think there will be lots of ways to you know to generate value. Um, but I think that those ways will will be more selective, and they will there will be a level of of privacy and security that is um, that is you know part of the expectation there. I mean, there is a lesson to learn from LVMH and other luxury groups on after sales, building communities, keeping communities going. I think the Ledger team has done a great job in building loyalty and after sales and love in the community and the successful projects. Um, Ethereum in the first instance had a great community, a great community of developers and people, it resonates with people, what they do and what they build and in the space, the most successful projects are the ones that are able to foster a good community and good relationships between everybody. Yeah, I, I think that I think you're right. I think that you know, if you're in, if you've been in the business of kind of self-expression or community in in the last twenty years, then you've you've kind of been in the right place. Um, and, I, and I think that it's something that uh, you know we we want to you know when we look at the future of Ledger, you know, we want to do an, an even an even better job of. And you know, for me, you know, looking back at you know, what we built with, with Winamp and, and Shoutcast, we were a very small team, but we had, you know, an army of people who, who, you know, they, even if they were just kind of making skins for the platform, it's not that they were even highly technical, but they were, they were really, they, they felt like owners, you know, and, and they were, they were owners, they were owners in the, in the community um, that, that we, and the, we, we built a movement, you know, and, and I think that, you know, that there's, there's clearly, um, a movement here and you know as they say it takes a village and, and that's I think I, I just think that that's where um, you know where the where the power um, the you know the true power of this of this industry um, emanates from yeah 
And I think different than the beginning of the internet, there is this power of a globally connected community to band together, work on amazing projects, um, learn from the most interesting people, which wasn't there in the beginning. That access, those videos, that upload speed was not there. Correct. Yeah, you didn't. You know, we we were we were building for um, a future community, right? I mean, you know, if you look at the dot com boom, um, there were you had kind of a lot of the right ideas in there, but you didn't have the audience for it yet. You know, so there were there were multiple people who had kind of the idea of Netflix, um, mm -hmm. you know, in, in 1998, 99. But, you know, you didn't have critical mass of consumers yet, um, you know, and, and so, yeah, you're right. We're, we're actually, you know, if you, when you look at the, at, the, at the crypto community, the connected user base is already there. Um, you know, the you know, people who are who are making transactions, uh, you know, without cash, that's already happening, you know for for everyone all all over all over the world you know so you've you've got kind of the the potential user base is is plugged in and you know it really is about building the applications um that that serve them how much do you agree with you're talking about the people that had the original ideas for netflix or the the the, the seedling of it i mean there's also the same being early is the same as being wrong there is in sure. many ways in crypto, we are way before our times. Is, is I, think that's, I think that's right. I, I think about that all the time because um, I have been too early and therefore wrong uh, on, on multiple occasions, right? I, I launched a $5 a month, all you can eat music subscription service for Yahoo with good distribution in May of 2005, three years before the iPhone, you know, totally the right idea but wrong timing, wrong, wrong, wrong platform. Um, and, you know, so that, that's definitely true. You know, I, I spent a decent amount of time with the Magic Leap team who I have a lot of respect for, you know, um, but I think I saw early on, I was like, wow, this is more like the Next or the Amiga um, than, you know, whereas they're, they're, this is probably going to be something that we look back on and say, that was brilliant. They had the vision. They were way too early. And I think that, you know, we don't want to be that. And when we think about the, the roadmap at Ledger, we think, you know, I, I think in other words, it, we would probably make do it wrong if we said, uh, okay, it's time to sell Ledger devices like you sell iPods at Target. We would probably miss the mark. It's too early for that. Um, you know, but I think that the Nano is the is exactly the right product for right now. You know, the yeah. Nano combined with Ledger Live, it's what people need right now because they want to self custody. They're they're not that familiar. They you know they they want the sort of the power of both self custody and cold storage. Um, you know, and and that is exactly what the market wants at the moment. So what I think what we need to be good at is anticipating. You know, what are those next? Um, you know, what are the next two, three, four, five features that people will want in 2021 and 2022, 2023? While we still have an eye, we know that, okay, 15 years from now, the world is going to be completely different. Mm -hmm. And I do think that's how long it takes. You know, I, I remember, you know, from the time that I, you know, built a computer from Fry's, hooked it to my television and was, you know, watching, you know, movies that I had downloaded off of Nutella on my television to my mom, getting rid of her cable subscription and having a Roku was 15 years, right? It was from, from roughly 99, 2000 or 98, 99 to, you know, whatever, you know, 15 years later. And I remember the time thinking that's how long it takes. That's how long it takes from when you think this is inevitable to when it arrives. So look, maybe, maybe that, maybe that changes because, you know, we're, we're at a different place in terms of the consumer internet. We're at a different place in terms of computing power where, you know, so maybe it's, maybe it's 15 years, maybe it's 10 years. I don't know, but I think, you know, to your point, being early is the same as being wrong. And we don't want to, um, uh, you know, we, we don't, we don't, I, I, again, like I have a ton of respect for, for magically, but, but spending that much money that far ahead is, you know, you become the pariah, not the success story. Well, Ian, thank you so much for your time. I'm, I hope your first interview uh, conversation as a part of the Ledger team went okay. It was painless for me. I hope that you and your, your audience uh, enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I look, I look forward to it. I look forward to us actually being in Miami together next year. I look forward um, to it. And uh, yeah, this was, it's great. And um, if anybody 
has any comments or needs anything from me, please reach out. Thanks.